All right, so let's just continue. Uh, first, let me just uh, show you this video. Uh, it seems like, uh, okay, so let me use my computer. Otherwise you won't hear the, otherwise you won't have problem to hear, I believe, so. Can you see the, uh, oh, okay, it's here. Time is the worst enemy, and that means everybody wants to speed it up as quickly as possible. I think on this moment, 10 years ago, we are talking about the half of the company is still there. And then because the, big, the, the bigger companies are getting bigger, and the smaller companies disappear. For over a century, the Ellesmere Flower Auction near Amsterdam has been at the heart of the global flower trade. From the distribution center here, more than 21 million flowers are shipped every day, representing some 60% of the international wholesale market. But in the last five years, a massive shift has taken place in the way flowers are bought and sold around the globe causing some to speculate that the auction's time may soon be over. Uh, might be 10 years if you're, if you're looking, maybe the additional truck. Buyers and growers are becoming increasingly large and more often now deal with one another directly, thereby eliminating the need for the auction system. The, the last five years, it changed uh, enormously. Uh, in, five years ago, we, we are doing only maybe, say, uh, let's say, uh, one or two percent uh, direct. But uh, on this moment, uh, for our company, is already 30, 40 percent is called direct. Further, by placing orders directly, buyers can reduce delivery time and be better prepared for some of the biggest days on the flower calendar. One of the most important uh, days of our year is that is the 8th of March. That is the International Women's Day. All the male people give the female people flowers. A unique Dutch institution, the auction system that is disappearing, has existed since flower buying went from the local pub to an organized industry. The clock is a full euro, billed out of 100 cents. So that means where the red dot stops is the price of only one flower. The auction clock is a bidding system that normally when we go to an auction, the price goes up and you can stop whenever you find the price too high. Here we do it the other way around. If you follow the red dot, you can see that the red dot starts high, runs backwards, stops and comes up again. But in a globalized world, speed is now king. And that has dramatically changed the way the auction itself works. Until last summer, carts brimming with flowers were brought out onto the floor. Buyers got to see and smell and touch them. Now, flowers are kept in cold storage to keep them fresher. Most buyers only see photos. I don't like how, how it goes now in the photos. You, you miss the feeling with the flowers. Oh, they know. The auction process itself has also increasingly moved to the internet. This is how we buy now at uh, at, at, at like we sit here with eight flower buyers and we buy on the on the TV screen. For decades, these seats were packed with buyers during auction. Now on a Friday, traditionally the biggest auction day of the week, the room can feel almost empty. It was five years ago, uh, more fun uh, on this place because, yeah, everybody was sitting there and, uh, yeah, there was friendship and competition. And now it's uh, complete silence. What's at stake is not just the existence of a century old, though perhaps quaint institution, but also, some say, the future of the Dutch flower industry. There is a threat. We have to deal with it. In what way? More in detail. We have to work that out. But we acknowledge there is uh, something changing in the world, indeed, and we have to act. But Dutch experts insist that even without the auction clock, centers like Al's Mirror will remain crucial to logistics, financial transactions, and know-how, and that it will be the Dutch who ultimately remain in control. It's impossible that all these hundred guys and these thousand guys have direct relations. So you always need somebody in between.
Okay, so that short video give you a idea. So how the uh, view world market equilibrium will be achieved, right? So there you can see the buyers and the sellers, they make their decision, essentially like a trade-off. Should I accept the price or should I wait? Or should I ask for a higher price or should I lower the price, right? So, but essentially everyone behave on their best interest, okay? And then eventually we are in the equilibrium. Uh, if you cannot fully understand the concept of equilibrium, don't panic, don't worry. We have a chapter to explain to you how demand and supply will yield equilibrium, right? So now a few more things I'll explain to you before we finish today's discussion. Okay. Uh, so far, I just explained to you six principles, okay? Uh, so from your previous pr uh, principle micro class, you may see more than six or less than six, but roughly they say the same things, right? In some sense, we can summarize the saying, oh, so in economics, so there's a scarcity. If everything is abundant, and then so we don't need to worry about uh, the trade-offs. Right, because you, or there's no choice to make because they're plentiful. But in reality, pretty much everything are scarce in terms of your time, your attention, your energy, your money, right? Or water, fresh air, right? And right now, so like the uh, uh, hospital bed, right? Everything are scarce. And then so we must make choice. And how we make choice, and then essentially, we just look at the trade-off. And what is trade-off essentially is the benefit and the cost of doing something more or less, right? The other thing that we mentioned or we reviewed is we make our decision in the margin, right? So regarding to the last bite, last action, okay? And, the, and then other things that we have to look at is, so the equilibrium. Right, so eventually we are going to be in the equilibrium. This is a situation no one has incentive to change or to divert from that particular situation. Okay. So that's the review of uh, micro. Uh, oh, one more thing that we also look at is specialization. So this specialization allows us to benefit from each other through trade. Okay. So we will have an entire chapter to explain how that happened. Okay. So now let's look at model. What is a model? Model is a simplified representation of real situation. Okay. And this simplification is used to better understand real life situation. Okay. Like in this background picture shows, okay. this background picture is an ancient map. Okay. So this map is used to represent or used to understand our uh, our world, right? So, but this is a simplified representation. Why this is a simplified representation? It is simplified in the following sense. Number one, the world is around the globe, but here, so it's difficult, probably it's impossible to, um, to plot in the, in the paper. And then so we flat, Flatten, flatten it out. So we have these um, like 2D representation, representation basically, right? The, the second uh, simplification is, so in the real world, so we have a 3D, right? So in the sense, you have mountain, you have deep oceans. But then so here it becomes almost impossible to do that. So in a, in a, a, in a paper. And then what we did is we use different color to represent mountain versus um, deep ocean, right? So in that sense, this is a simplified representation. And so this is easier for us to carry, easier for us to understand our work, right? So certainly we make some trade-offs. So we make it simpler 
um, if we lose the complexity, we lose some details. But so we can by understand this in the easier way. Okay, so the calculation is easier, right? So this is the model. Now, here we have a principle you're gonna see throughout the class. So this principle and the the word is called ceteris paribus. So this is coming from Latin, I believe. So translated into English, it means other things equal assumptions. They just says or other relevant factor remains unchanged. Okay. So first let me give you an example and then let me explain to you why we do that. Example can be, oh, so you want to understand how the weather affects the gasoline price, right? But usually when weather change, there are many other things can change simultaneously, right? So when weather change, yeah, and so people may decide to travel less, right? But then both will have impact on the gasoline price. It's difficult to disentangle the impact of weather on gasoline price. And then so here, in order to have a sharper understanding or prediction regarding to the impact of weather on gasoline, we must apply this ceteris paribus assumption. We assume, so when weather change, nothing else change, right? regarding to your travel decision, right? regarding to your other consumptions. Right? And then so here we can look at the pure impact of weather on gasoline price. But then, so we can do this analysis for many other factors. But for each analysis, we apply these serious purpose assumptions. And towards the end, so if you want to understand the real change, I mean, the real economic situation change on the gasoline price, and then you aggregate them together so that you have a better understanding. But our starting point is we apply this, this ceteris purpose assumption so that we can study one particular economic force. How would that affect the economic outcome for a particular thing? Right? So this is called ceteris purpose. We will see this principle many times in this class. Okay. Now, so we can start, I can give you an introduction for the second part of this class, right? So the first things we will study in this part of the lecture is the production possibility frontier, okay? So this production possibility frontier, uh, we short for PPF, okay? So PPF is a diagram that shows the combination of two goods that are possible for society to produce at full employment. So there are many information in the, inside this. Let's just go one by one. But first of all, so this PBF is a good example of model as we just look at, right? So this is an example of model in the sense, look, here we say we use this diagram to show combination of two goods. So these two is a simplification. So essentially these two represent more or many. Right? So two is different from one because if there's only one goods you can use or you can produce. And then so there will be no notion of production possibility frontier. You just spend all your resource to produce that one particular goods. But now later in this slide, you're gonna see, so you have a choice in terms of producing A versus B, right? And then there is a combination of possibilities. 
right? Well, this too is a simplification because in reality, usually the society produce more than two. But two is good enough for us to understand the trade-off between uh, produce A versus producing B, right? So two is easier to analyze compared to three because if you are trying to understand the combination of three goods, and then so we must go to higher dimension like 3D, and then the analysis becomes very complicated and messy. Okay, so in that sense, so this two is a simplification, but give us better understanding. Okay. Now let's just look into this definition. So PBA, number one, it is a diagram. This is number one. And then number two, so we use this diagram to show, show what? Show the combination of goods we can produce. Okay, so two, they just represent many or more, right? Let's compare with one. And this diagram is to show how much we can produce or what's the combination of two goods we can produce. Think about apple versus pear. Think about cotton versus corn. Think about computer versus cell phone, right? Now, the other things inside this concept is, so the combination of goods that are possible for a society to produce, right? So this is your feasibility, right? This possible measuring what is feasible, right? And then last three, so here we stress, so this is what a society can produce at full employment, okay? It just means at your full capacity. There's nothing idle, nothing wasted, okay? We use all resources, okay? So that is the PBA. To summarize, so PBF is a diagram. So this is a diagram to use to show what we can possibly produce. Okay? And to simplify, we just show what we can produce in terms of the combination of two different goods. And furthermore, we are going to show what we can produce at full employment, okay? you won't have any reservation regarding to your capacity. You use your full capacity. Okay, so this is the definition of PBF, right? But by the way, so this um, PBF also give us a good summary regarding to the definition. Start with production. Now this is what you can produce. And then the second word is possibility. This just shows what we can possibly produce. And the last three, so this PBA says frontier. So what is frontier? This is the best you can do, right? Just think about in US history. So back in 1800 or mid of 19th century, uh, St. Louis probably is considered as a frontier of the West, right? Because we go beyond St. Louis. And then, so we are in the complete wilderness. And then, so later they push the frontier further to like Omaha and then Denver, right? So this frontier is the best we can do, and the most that we can explore, right? And then, so here, so this frontier just tells us what the economy can possibly produce at full employment. That's the best we can do, right? Okay, so that's the definition of PBF. Now, what we can use or why we spend time to study this PBF? Okay. So actually, so this PBF is going to be used to answer the following questions. How much can we produce? Okay. And then, so we can also use this PBA to understand 
what will it cost us to change our mix of production? Like say for example, so in the United States, look at aggregate economy. So we are mix of production in terms of manufacturing goods versus service goods. What is considered manufacturing? Think about in, in Michigan. So US produce lots of cars. What is service? Think about Google, think about Facebook, or even include Apple, right? So they produce service, like internet service, software, networking, right? And then, so from the economy point of view, and then, so this PBA is going to tell us what is the cost if we shift away from manufacturing-based to service-based, right? And this can also help us understand a question like, does it make sense to import the good from somewhere else? Like in the United States, should we import avocado from Mexico? Or should we import computer chips from Japan? Right? And so the answer will lies into a better understanding of PBF. Or in other words, this PBF will help us understand those deep economic questions. Okay, so I will stop here for today and the next class after we have a quick review of what we have done and then so I'm going to these slides directly. Um, to, for this week, there really isn't much for you need to do because most of the deadline will be next week. But again, so just remind you, so you need to finish your syllabus grade, you need to finish your um, pre-test or the assessment question. And then, so if you can, you start work on your um, homework one or assignment one, All right? Thank you so much for your time and then have a great weekend. See you on Tuesday.